Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you here this evening for our Monday, May 16, 2022, Board of Commissioners meeting. Um, at uh, 5 o'clock, we had the uh, Board of Equalization uh, and Review. Uh, the Board, once a year, sits through that. Um, and uh, now I'll go ahead and call the uh, 6 o'clock meeting to order. And our first item is the Invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Jarvis if she would lead us in that tonight. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come to this place to do the people of the business of the people of Currituck County. We are so thankful for the opportunity and the freedom to freely get together and discuss our ideas and to listen uh, as we make decisions that impact this county. We ask that you go with our visitors here tonight as they head home, keep them safe. Uh, and keep us as we travel home safely as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Jarvis. The next item is the approval of the agenda. Is there any changes or can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Motion for approval. Second. I have a second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Approval passes. Uh, the next uh, item is public comment. Um, this is a time for citizens to come before the board. Um, you have three minutes of uninter uninterrupted time to speak whatever's on your mind, ask questions, concerns, comments, good, bad. Um, and the board will um, listen to your comments without interruption. Um, when you come up, you'll see a green light at the podium there when you start, and then when you see the yellow light, it gives you, tells you like you got 30 seconds remaining to try to wrap up your thoughts or comments, and the red light tells you the time is up. So just if you could just kind of wrap up your thoughts or comments on that. Um, we have the first person signed up we have is uh, Susie Sullivan Rainwater. If you could come forward and state your name and address, please, for the record. My name is Susie Sullivan Rainwater. I live at 115 Newburn Road in Jarvisburg, North Carolina. I am here to ask you guys for some assistance on the drainage problem that we're having, mostly that are affecting the residents that are in front of us. Um, Beverly is on her way. She's running late, so she won't be able to speak. But we have some pictures that I have sent uh, to Leanne. Um, Larry Wright lives at 775, right? 775. And he's had so much water that has come to his foundation of his home. And his health is not all that great, so I'm a little concerned for him. DOT put a culvert pipe down just beyond his house up to the stop sign, but I'm not sure why he put that cul they put that culvert pipe down. Seems like where the culvert pipe is, there's a little bit of a ditch but it is pretty much backed up. We've opened it ourselves on our end as much as we could. Um, there has been in the past few years some mining of sand behind the house and a couple of parcels and we walk the ditch and there appears to be some clogging on that end too. I think the main part that affects the residents would be the one on uh, that corners South Bayview and New Bern Road. The ditch that's clogged in the back, um, I do have an aerial. I don't mind passing it to you all if you want to see it, but you'll see the pits that have been dug behind. That clog pretty much goes behind Thomas Newburn's house and floods his area back there, but I haven't heard him, him complain too much about that. Um, the horse pasture we own <coughs> down the way, that floods right often too. So we just want to know what the options are and what are available. Um, I'm up here basically because of the safety of, of the, the older people that live up front. I mean, you know, you got two or three feet of water up there, and it doesn't run anywhere. You know, what's going to happen? It, it's septic, and it, it's just not healthy. So anything you could share with us to make it better, and we're reaching out for help, uh, any options that we can have. Thank you for okay, your and time. So you had some photos. Yes. If I you, give you, Leanne's got them, or you got them, I can okay. give you I can give you this aerial. 
if you want, and you know, we can get some copies made or whatever. Have it. I don't know yeah. I did pull some old surveys and plots from behind. You can look at these. I do want these back, please. Um, but there's no main drain ditch shown there. But why would DOT put a culvert pipe there and not assure that it was going to drain properly if it wasn't a main ditch? So Don't know, but we have them here tonight, so maybe they'll answer that when they come up here for okay. you. Okay. We'll okay. Here. Okay. Thank you guys for what you do. All right. Thank you. Okay, that is the only individual I had signed up to speak about any concerns. Is there anyone who showed up maybe late that didn't get a chance to sign up that would like to speak at the public comment section? If there are, if you just please come up to the mic up here and state your name and address for the records. Okay, my name is Paulette Harris and it's about the safety issue uh, on Edgewater Road in Harbinger. Could you state your address, please? Um, did, did you, uh, could you state your address where you live at? Please? Oh, 164 Edgewater Road. Okay. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. All okay. Um, we're having two different issues. Uh, one happened to me on December the 17th at nighttime. I was coming for Walmart getting ready to turn down Edgewater Road off the uh, 158 bypass. And the way that the there's a crown from 158 going down off uh, onto um, Edgewater Road. And when it's dark, there's no um, street light there to light up uh, to make sure that uh, you see where you're turning. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I just parked in the ditch. <laughs> but didn't hurt anything. And uh, so that's one of the issues. The second issue is, well, the first issue, we need a, a, a light there to lighten up the corner so you can see at night where you're turning. And the second issue is we're having too many accidents there. Uh, and it's uh, because of the Dollar General. And second of all, whenever anybody's going to the Dollar General, but they, I've seen them get into the turning lane as far up as uh, Sun Realty and then go right on down. If you're in the turning lane to make a left-hand turn to go on the Edgewater Road, they don't want to give an inch. And they just expect you to just let them ride on through. And they are nowhere near the turn to go into the driveway of uh, Dollar General. And now that we've got the issue of the Buffalo City opening up, it's going to be a nightmare. And I do have pictures of accidents from August the 5th, of various, um, right on up until the accident they had this past Friday and the accident that was this past Friday a week ago. And it involved two cars both times. Okay. And something just, we need some kind of a safety precaution there that could save lives, not only my life, the life of my neighbors, but also yours and yours and anybody else that happens to be traveling there. And it's just, it's just a nightmare. And I just don't know what else to do, okay. except for maybe trying to push for a stoplight. I know they would have to do some re-engineering to get a stoplight there, but it could save lives. Okay, and you said you had some pictures with you? I do. If you wanted to give them to Leanne, she can make sure that the board and DOT or anybody else could get those just to look at later. Chairman, payment, may I? Yes, go ahead, ask questions. Ms. Harris, that's exactly one of the reasons. She, her her hearing is coming. Okay. That's, let me just say, that's one of the reasons that I've, I'm thrilled that DOT is here. I live off of Edgewater Road as well, and it is a daily daily taking my life into my hands anytime I leave my house. And uh, I'm glad that you came. I'm glad you spoke. And I hope we get some answers. One of those, I, I, if I'd like to add just oh, one of those, and I can't go into detail, but one of those bad wrecks that we had, there was a medical medical situation with somebody too. And I just, from my other position, I know that. So, I mean, but we have had some, some wrecks there. I could actually pull it up on this computer while we're sitting in here. Yeah, we're Okay. Well. <laughs> okay. 
But like she said, a, a street light would not hurt, you know, where you could see a little bit, especially at nighttime when somebody turns in there because the gas station cuts most of their lights off. <coughs> Which, Selena, you can attest for because you're... Yeah. Well, okay. I'll give another minute here. Okay, is there anyone else who may have showed up late that wishes to speak to the board and get a chance to sign up to public comment? If you do, come on forward, please state your name and your address for the record, please. Morris Gray, 160 Edgewater Road. Uh, continuing what she was speaking about, in the summertime, the traffic is horrendous there. You're, back, you're held hostage in that western part of the road. You can't go anywhere on the weekend because of the traffic. The lights there at Kitty Hawk, he's got it backed up way past us going up toward Grandy. If there was a light there, it would break it up and would help the people to the, to the south of us getting, to, getting on the road, doing their business and going to the stores and stuff. And if you have a medical emergency, you're in a scrape on the weekend, they'd have to have a helicopter to go to your house to get you. And... That's just about it. I was a, I was a, uh, I got T-bone there mm. last a year this month. I was turning in uh, to Edgewater Road, and a, a fellow was at the stop site, and there was traffic, and he was he jumped the gun to try to get out, and he T-boned me as I was turning in, mm -hmm. tore my truck up. Mm. But what can you say? I just hope that you fellows would have would really help us down there. Okay. It would help everybody else to the north and to the south of us. Okay. God right. bless you. Thank you, sir. Okay, is there anyone else that would like to speak um, before the board didn't get assigned? Come on up, please, and state your name and address for the record. I'm Beverly Sermon. I live at 113 Newburn Road in Jarvisburg. Following up on what Susie said, I can go out on a r real heavy rainstorm and the water in my backyard is up to my knees. If a hurricane comes, the water comes across, it's all the way up to the siding on my neighbor's yard. It's really bad. They used to come and clear the ditches and everything else, but so pro do that anymore. When the ditches were cleared, everything was fine? And not like it is now. Okay. 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 Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there any other who may have showed up late that wishes to speak that didn't get a chance to sign up? Okay. <clears throat> Seeing no one else, I'm going to go ahead and close the public comment portion of this meeting and move into the next item, which is the commissioner's report. And this evening, I'm going to start off to my right over here with Commissioner Owen Etheridge, sir. I'll be short tonight. Tomorrow is election day. Vote because your future depends on it. Thank you, Commissioner Owen. Um, Commissioner McCord. Um, just want to continue what he said. You know, tomorrow is voting day. If you didn't early vote, early voting turnout was very, very low. Not in our, only our county, Dare and Camden. I know uh, early voting in Pasco Bank was like almost more than the three of our counties combined. Um, if you don't vote, you can't complain. So um, that and uh, this week is EMS and police week for law enforcement. Um, our county is very fortunate. We have some very good EMTs as well as deputies and throw the highway patrol and all the other anybody that puts that vest on and that badge and that gun and has to deal with some of the stuff that we deal with. And today's times is not very easy. Um, and like I said, just like EMS, I mean, those guys see a lot of bad stuff day in and day out that the average citizen doesn't see. So um, if you see one of those guys, uh, shoot them a thanks, EMTs, uh, law enforcement or anything. And that's about it. Oh, and the weather on the beach last week was horrendous. I mean, in the county, it was brutal. The sound, I've never seen the water, the sound almost empty, like I thought somebody had stole our water. And um, like I said, prayers to anybody that had damages, extensive damages at the beach and 
it's good to see the water's back in and the water's not destroying everything in Corral and Corova. So that's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Beaumont. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, tonight, <coughs> uh, the people of Kurtuk County are going to have um, the proposed budget is going to be presented this evening. Everyone who is interested on where the county and the taxes go that are collected <coughs> and has an opinion as to where they should be spent and how they should be spent needs to look at that budget and go through it. And um, because just like I would venture to say everyone in here, uh, things are more expensive. Fuel is more expensive. Groceries are more expensive. And if you think about what it's costing to run your household, we have an entire county that imagine the magnitude of the rising costs, what's, what it's doing to us. That's just to provide the services that we already are providing. So there's two things that I would ask, that is you look at the budget and, you know, as you're, if you don't understand, number one, please feel free to question your commissioner or any of the commissioners. That's number one. But number two, as we're putting these things out, uh, and you may um, be challenged with where some of the county's uh, money is being spent, I want you to consider what services you would cut as part of uh, the rising cost of doing business. Nothing is free in this county. And uh, Kurta County, I know Ike and the staff have done a tremendous job trying to keep everything um, under control. And, uh, you know, they need to be um, commended for the hard work and the amount of hours that have, they've been put in. I had the opportunity to stop by Sandra's office and at least the damage from the bomb going off appeared to have gotten better, but it, it it is not easy putting together a budget for a county this size with a budget this large. And so, um, you know, it's, it's we, we get criticized and that's fine. Uh, we certainly understand that. But I would encourage, we will have the link and it will be coming up in this meeting. And if you have any questions on how to find the budget, uh, feel free again to ask any one of us. You could call Leanne and uh, that, that, okay, don't call Leanne, call Sam. <laughs> But uh, we'll be happy to provide you those links. But, you know, we encourage the public to look at that budget. It's our county's budget. That's, that's what we pay. That's what we expect to pay to run this county. So um, please get involved. Again, please get involved. Uh, despite, you know, public meetings, we really did not have much, if any, public participation in the discussing of those budgets. They are open to the public. You are more than welcome to come in and sit and hear what we're hearing. And, you know, we, again, we look forward to your, your comments and your suggestions. Your, you know, we'll take input from anybody. But thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Um, and I'll just, just to tag on that a little bit, the board is not taking any action tonight on the budget. All we're doing is having to present it to us. So it's going to give, and, and, and the county managers can go through that uh, later. So, um, like I said, no action. We're going to be reviewing it and give the uh, time for input um, before any action is even taken. So um, that and also, um, you know, busy season coming up, tourist season. Remember your first responders, your fire departments, uh, police officers, EMS, you know, just everybody out there because it's getting busy. I mean, the pages, the phone, I mean, it's crazy out there right now. I mean, I'm constantly getting uh, pages for accidents and fires. Um, so just support them any way you can. Just showing up and telling them a thank you would, I mean, they, that, that means a lot to them out there. Um, other than that, just be safe and remember tomorrow, yeah, get out and support your candidate and um, exercise your right to vote. Thank you. That's all I have. Commissioner White. Thank you, Mr. Ooh. Chairman. Um, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> I just want to say thanks to the people that showed up here this evening. It's, it's refreshing to actually see people in our audience. It's been a while. So uh, um, if you have something to say to us, please come up. That's the only way we hear it, uh, really, uh, is, is through public participation. And uh, having you come out tonight sheds light on things that we don't know about, unless you're Selena and happen to live down in Edgewater. <laughs> but, uh, but the rest of us don't know, and um, we're here to be advocates for you. That's, that's what we're here to do. So uh, it, it is refreshing to see you here. Um, I'm sure everyone knows we had a five-day blow, a good nor'easter. We haven't had one of those in years. And I was looking back through pictures, and 
18 was the last time I found that we had something that severe. And um, so for the folks on the beach, uh, we received emails that, you know, it's terrible. It looks like a war zone over there. Well, it probably does, and, and in fact, usually does after something like that. They can be much more destructive than a hurricane um, due to the st sustained nature of those. Uh, but be assured, uh, at a county level here, uh, we are working diligently to get the beach cleaned up, to remove the debris from the beach, to make necessary repairs to the county assets over there, the walkovers and things of that nature, so that they're safe for the general public. But that can't happen overnight. We have to mobilize uh, contracts that we have in place to have that happen, and we've got 20 miles, 20 plus miles of beach to clean up, so that does take more than a day or two to get done. So just please be patient with us. Uh, we received quite a bit of uh, uh, emails about uh, beach nourishment, and um, this county has undertaken a multi-year study of the shoreline to understand what is going on with our shoreline and where in fact that nourishment may be uh, necessary or not. So we're going into year three of that study, that will be this fall, and uh, we'll receive that, um, that information later in, in December uh, at uh, probably our annual retreat is generally when we receive that. And uh, that will affect our plan going forward. So we are doing something about it. Uh, but this is the first part of the process to do that. It is a long and very expensive process, and uh, we don't want to have a knee-jerk reaction or do something that would be wasteful in any way as it's your tax dollars we're going to spend uh, ultimately. So that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Etheridge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know it looks like us Etheridges are having a difficult time, but I did not fall. I did have a couple of cancers removed. And since I'm not vain, I decided I'd come on to the meeting. Please don't forget that tomorrow is primary election day in North Carolina. The polls are open from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Tomorrow you must vote at your polling place, and some of our voters here in the county have had their polling place changed. If you voted at the fire department in Water Lily, you will now vote at the Currituck County Library in Barco. If you vote in Moyoc and you live east of Currituck Highway, which is 168, you will continue to vote at the Moyoc Elementary School. If you live west of Currituck Highway, 168, you will vote at the Moyoc Middle School. Everybody should have received a notice from the Board of Elections office telling them of this move if you have any questions, give them a call at 232-2525, or you can go online and check your voter registration from the county's website. And remember, no complaints if you vote, if you don't vote. So if you want to continue to complain, you've got to get out and vote. As I stated at our last meeting, I would like to recommend, in order to inspire public trust and confidence in our local government, that before we conduct business that we have an ethics statement. Several commissioner boards in North Carolina do this as well as other boards, and I serve on the ABC board, and before every meeting we have an ethics statement. I would like to recommend the following statement be read before our meetings. In accordance with the State Government Ethics Act, it is the duty of every board member to, both, to avoid both conflicts of interest and appearance of conflict. Does any board member have any known conflict of interest or appearance of conflict of interest with respect to any matter coming before this board? If so, please identify the conflict or appearance of conflict and refrain from any undue participation in the matter involved. This is not to make you not vote, but it is to make us look more transparent. And I think this is something that we as fellow board members should not have an issue with. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Etheridge. And um, that is something that we'll get that verbiage out to the fellow board members to see if they want to add to it at all and then we'll get some feedback and, and look forward to moving forward with that. Thank you. Uh, okay, next, uh, Commissioner Jarvis. Thank you. Um, this week, as uh, Commissioner McCord mentioned, is both EMS Week and National Police Week, and I just want to say thank you to all of our first responders uh, who are out there on the front lines keeping our roads safe 
for the accidents that happen, for the fires that happen, for just the safety issues that we sometimes experience in our neighborhoods. I'm just thankful for both our EMS and our um, sheriff's deputies and um, responders. Um, I also would like to say that uh, I agree with what Ms. Etheridge said about the ethics statement. I have pulled up uh, our ethics statements. I sit as the uh, trustee on the College of the Albemarle uh, Board of Trustees, and this is what we read before every meeting uh, that we have. The College of the Albemarle Board of Trustees is subject to state, govern uh, state Government Ethics Act. This imposes several duties on us all, including the avoid to avoid the uh, conflict of interest or the appearance of conflicts of interest. The agenda for tonight's meeting has been circulated in advance. Any member who's got a known conflict of interest or is aware of the appearance of a conflict of er interest with respect to the matter coming before the board should now disclose that to us. Anyone who determines during the course of the meeting that they have a conflict of interest or that there is appearance of a conflict of interest in any matter that comes before the board should let the board chair know at the appropriate time. So I agree. and. Uh, I definitely think this is something that we should move forward. Uh, transparency is very important, and I believe uh, if we can instill that confidence that we have nothing to personally gain, it would be a strong step in that direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I, I guess I would just add then that if the county manager may look at um, maybe putting some kind of verbiage together, some kind of ethic, ethic statement that would be appropriate for this board and then get something to us to look at and review and be glad to prepare something to yep. circulate it to the board. Sounds good. Okay. I don't think we do. Just want to make sure just, just look at the verb and see if we need to add to it or structure it in such a way that it's appropriate for the board of commissioners and whatnot. So, but I'll let the county manager work on that and get something together for us. Can Mr. I, Chairman, I've, can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Real quick. Go ahead then. Uh, Wednesday, Communications 911 will finally move into their oh, new good. facility at the Public Safety Building. Good. I know they've been looking forward They're to that. They're about 99% in there now. Good. Can I add one thing, too, Mr. Chairman? This is actually what <sighs> okay. uh, Commissioner White right. said. Um, that shoreline stability, I've had a lot of people ask questions about that, and I know we had that big book when we had the, uh, I guess it was our, was it, the, was it the retreat we did? That? Okay. Is there anything that's any way a citizen, because I've had people, and I've just, I mean, it's public record. I've let let's do, let's, okay, Is let's, it online? Okay, yeah, let's do this, and let's, when, during his county manager's report, let's let him address that then, or you can ask that's a fine. question. I'll ask that question, then okay. I'll hold it. Let's hold that okay. there Thanks. for then. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, um, that concludes the commissioner's report. The next item is our county manager's report, attorney's report. First of all, the shoreline study is a public record, so it can be made available to anyone, as Commissioner <coughs> Beaumont said, Vice Chairman <coughs> Beaumont said, it, it, it is online. Okay. Uh, for access, um, so certainly would like everybody to, to take a look at it. The, the third phase will, will be underway this year. I think they're actually on the beach right now, mm -hmm. uh, beginning the analysis for this third year, um, and then they'll be presenting us their findings. One of the interesting things that you will remember from the last report was that we, and they, they couldn't really explain it, but they were seeing actually sand coming into our system from the south, where we know our brothers and sisters in Dare County are re receiving a lot of beach nourishment, but it seems to perhaps be heading our way into our system. So it'd be interesting to see <laughs> if that good. trend continues uh, in phase three of the If they measure it this week, the no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with, with, with regard to this, I'm sorry. sorry. The, the, the point, though, is, and if, if you would expand or expound a little bit on that study doesn't look at what the sand dune itself looks like, Okay, never mind. I'm already here. <laughs> it actually looks out, I want to say, 1,500 feet off the beach, typically up to and including the sand dunes. So during a storm that we just had, the sand that used to be in the sand dunes and against the sand dunes is now in the sandbox is the way they phrased it. And it's part of the cycle. <clears throat> Storms come, sand goes into the ocean, then the waves wash it all back up. I know Commissioner White, I was at the beach two weeks ago, and the amount of sand that covered walkways and the stairs going up was incredible. Mm -hmm. That's the natural, that's the, the cycle. So um, anybody that's watching this that's concerned, I, sand, be patient, sand will be back. Quickly. Well, just another point, we, we, of course we have a, a handicap accessible ramp 
at Corolla Village Road. The county <coughs> has erected there. Uh, it became uh, unusable after a, a, an earlier nor'easter. We lost a lot of sand, so the drop-off was too large for it to be accommodated uh, for uh, disabled persons. Uh, so we were trying to figure out what to do with that. Um, when the sand started building back up and we felt like we were getting close to the matter resolving itself naturally until, of course, last week. So your point is well taken that these are natural give and takes that occur on our beaches and can certainly expect that we'll see the same type of um, reprocessing by nature to make our, our beach what we're used to seeing uh, more typically. Um, with regard to the storm, um, I did want to uh, point out some, that the county uh, staff was uh, engaged last week during the storm and pre preparing to evaluate uh, any damage to county facilities or personal property or uh, any debris that may have gathered on the beach. Um, particular thanks to uh, assistance of the county manager, Rebecca Gay, emergency management director, Mary Beth Noons, uh, public works um, operations manager, Rachel Anderson, and, and our superintendent over on the beach, Will Sawyer who all quickly after, were all quickly as the storm was subsiding, were starting to mobilize uh, and get an idea through a county contractor to survey the entirety of our beach to see what the type of damage and debris was on the beach in preparation for a, a quote from our contractor for cleanup. Um, uh, Will Sawyer uh, took the county uh, heavy equipment up the beach in order to um, repair, uh, improve ramps that have become unusable or dangerous to use. Uh, spent the whole day Friday uh, doing that. Uh, saved the county a lot of money and, and got it done very quickly without us having to go through a contract process to have that uh, taken care of. Uh, today we received a quote from our contractor uh, in about, about $45,000 to clean uh, the beach. The, but the bulk of the debris seems to be from our contractor's view from the Dare County line north uh, to the horse fence. Uh, oh, no, north to Albacore, I'm sorry. And so that, that certainly would be an area that we'll be focused on, but, but they, are, they are ready. We're starting to work with a contract now to get them out there this week uh, to start, start the cleanup. So county staff is on it, and much thanks to, to them for, for being prepared to, to move on that. That's all I have, Mr. Oh, Chairman. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for answering that question. Okay. All right, our next item is administrative reports, and this evening we have uh, NCDOT uh, to report to the board. So I'd ask them if they could come forward, please, and just introduce yourself. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Wynn Bridgers. I'm the division engineer for NCDOT Division One. As you may have seen in previous meetings, Sterling Baker was your division engineer, but he lost a courageous battle of cancer on April 20th, mm -hmm. and, and, and I have been named his successor as the division engineer. Each of you have a presentation. I was informed that we had a limit of 13 slides, 12 slides. So, well, we're going to get on through and skip the ones that, <laughs> no, <laughs> that I can skip so I stay under the bar. But uh, No, you're fine. You just take it. <laughs> as I said, my name is Wynn Bridgers. I have been with DOT 31 and a half years, all here in Division One, in more capacities than I will take time to name. Uh, some of the staff we have with us today, Ronnie Sawyer is the Division Maintenance Engineer. Some of you may remember Ronnie, who was kind of maintenance engineer for a while. Randy Midget, Division Construction Engineer. Gretchen Byron, Division Project Development Engineer. Craig Midget, Division Planning Engineer. David Otts, District Engineer. And your new county maintenance engineer, Jim Hoadley. So if we have <coughs> questions, I hopefully we've got somebody here who can answer it. And as I like to tell people when I come, if we don't know the answer, we'll take it down. We'll go back and see if we can find you one. So each of you have a presentation. You see the draft. This is small. I know it's hard for everybody to read, but we gave it as a handout so you can at least have a look at it and have that information to go back and review later. But this covers your uh 24 to 1933 draft state transportation improvement program or the STIP as everybody refers to it. 
the projects that we have on this are the two projects that are at the top would be SR 1227 and 1208, NC 343 in Camden to 168 or Old Swamp Road, South Mills Road. Everybody's got their own name, but it's the modernization project to widen that, safe that up, and allow it to accommodate traffic in a better manner than it is now. Um, it is currently uh, project number R5717 and is currently on the projected schedule for construction in 2024. The next one on the list is one that's near and dear to everybody, the Currituck, Mid-Currituck Bridge, which has been in the news enough lately and everybody's heard it. You know, uh, DOT won the lawsuit, an appeal was filed, and I believe an amicus brief is, has been or is being filed to actually try to have the Court of Appeals not even hear the appeal. So this project is continuing on regardless of that court case right now. We're going to move on like we're going to be successful in the court case. So that project is ongoing. I know that back before COVID, there was a request that somebody come and speak about that project. And there was two or three other issues. And then COVID came and we sort of, everything fell by the wayside. But as we go through some of this stuff tonight, I know there's some issues that have come up. And if it requires people other than the ones who are here to address specificity, we'll come back and deal with specific issues that may be larger than you want to get into tonight with the staff we have here. So, and you see at the bottom, the shortcut road, that is actually not funded. It's actually, and is subject to reprioritization. Brief, uh, brief speaking on the step. As you may have heard from your Albemarle RPO, no new projects will be accepted for nomination into the STIP this year. What we call 6.0 will not accept any projects. What they're going to do is you'll go in. Some of them will be, um, be kept or, or in the to-be-delivered category. There will be a lot of other projects through your RPO that are subject to reprioritization. There's an option to do some swapping up and down the list for projects that may, at one point in the past, may not have been may not have been as high a priority, but due to other things that have come along since they were prioritized, things may have changed. And something may become more important now that wasn't important then. So there's an option for the RPO to come back and possibly do some rearranging. These that you see on here that are locked in, it may be subject to prioritization, but that's not hardly going to change. They need to stay there because they're actually in the works. Um, as we talked about the mid Currituck Bridge, this is just a data sheet. Most of you have probably seen this more times than you can count. 4.7 mile bridge, mile 4.7 mile project. Uh, really two bridges, a new interchange, a roundabout on the east end, uh, some widening of NC-12 will provide hurricane evacuation clearance time, reductions, improvements to 158 in the southern shores, left turn at Albacore. This is the detail that resolves around the Old Swamp South Mills project. Gives you a brief description. And down at the bottom, you can see that it's right away is now in progress. So if right away is in progress, we don't push them back. You know, if, the, if it's that close to right, if it's in right away and it's going to construction 24, it needs to go. There is actually a separate safety project that was pulled out of this to deal with the intersection of South Mills Road and 168, which will add signals at that intersection, which is actually was part of this project, but because this one was delayed a little bit, they were pulled out and left to be put in place. You can see at the bottom of the cross section of what your road's going to look like, and it's much easier for you to see on your hand out than it is uh, on the screen right now. But you can see it's widen, widen shoulders, um, widening some curves, making them easier to traverse uh, for safety issues. One that has been brought up, obviously, by the residents is 158 at Edgewater. Um, it has been studied by the feasibility unit and are currently pricing the quantities to convert it to a reduced conflict intersection, which fancy name used to that's a different Edgewater. They're talking about Edgewater Road. This is okay. Edgewater Drive. Well, we'll need to, we'll go back and study that, and that'll be something we we deal with. Because, but this one is 158 Edgewater Drive, uh, which would actually 
is proposed to install a reduced conflict intersection, which is the new fancy term for a Michigan left, which is a new fancy term for a super street, which essentially everybody has probably driven on somewhere. You pull out, you turn right, you go down the road, get in the left lane and turn around. And even though it's a way to deal with congestion and it's really access management. We have another project going on in our division that it was recommended that this is the fix. There's actually a stoplight there now at a four lane with a median and another primary road crossing it. And there's been numerous accidents there. The solution as determined by DOT study is the reduced conflict intersection. We've had a lot of people that have expressed a lot of dissatisfaction with, well, people can't drive that. And I won't, to say, well, they drive it everywhere else in the world. And it's one of those things that once you get used to it, you understand. A lot of people say access management, taking the media night. Oh, I can't have a left turn in front of my business. I've heard people say, and I think our experts have proven it, if you feel safe turning, going down the road and coming back, you'll go out of the way to go to a business you want to go to on the left-hand side of the road. You might not turn left in a middle turn lane across two lanes of traffic if you're scared that it's not safe for you. If the road is made safer, people will go and turn and go to these businesses. There's data that proves that this actually works and actually increases business traffic to people on the other side of the median because people feel comfortable making that move. So um, that is one of the ones that's being studied, and that's at SR 1104 Edgewater Drive. Is, is this like you guys did down on, is it uh, 17, I think? I, you, you widened it, and it, you go to, you make a right, and you make a U-turn, and you yes. widen on the opposite yes. side of the street. Yes. Yeah, and that's, and, that's and, what you're proposing. And, and to, <clears throat> to describe what it does is if you're crossing the road, you pull up to an intersection. The one I'm talking about is in, is in Hereford County. Mm -hmm. this, one's, this is five lanes. If you pull up for some reason, suppose you want to go all the way across. What have you got to watch for? Two lanes coming to you, somebody in that middle lane, and two lanes on the other side. And you got to, you got to guesstimate, okay, I got to get across all of these to get to the other side of the road. Oh, if I want to turn left, I got to cross two lanes, and I got to take a chance. The middle lane, everybody, I'm going to use a term that nobody likes to hear, but everybody knows it. it's called a suicide lane. Everybody's heard it all their life. There's no need to hide from it. That lane was designed for people to get in and turn. It wasn't designed to be an acceleration lane. But what does everybody use it for? Acceleration. They pull out. They look. Somebody's coming. They get in the center lane. They get up to speed and they merge in, right? That's not what it's designed for. The reduced conflict intersection takes that out. You turn right. You go down the road till you can move over comfortably. You get in a turn lane. You go around the bulb, and you go back the other way. You only have to look for the cars coming. If you're going that way, you only have to look for the cars coming from this way. You don't have to worry about what's coming the other way. Once you get lined up and get in the turn lane, look what's coming. Then you worry about them. So you have to look at only one set of traffic and not really three sets. Something that's near and dear to Division One. The Alligator River Bridge. We want to thank everybody, every entity in Currituck County that has sent resolutions in the past. And if you want to file another resolution, please feel free to file another one. Because we actually have a, an engineering firm now drafting up a grant or writing a grant application for the infra grant from federal money to try to get funding for this. Now, it won't fund all of it, but anything we get is more than, we'll, than we have now. Design is proceeding accordingly. We are carrying on with design, regardless of whether that grant is successful. There will be other grants that come along, and if this grant's not successful, we're going to file another one. And when that grant, if that one doesn't work, we're going to file another one to continue to get funding for the Alligator River. Um, this is a project. It's a perfect example of what really works. We started conversations with all the agencies. Everybody got around the table from scratch. And if anybody over here, if anybody in my group has anything to contribute, I wish you would. We got with the groups. We got with all the agencies. We started talking. We said, we need to build a bridge. Here's why. 
And the group started talking, started talking, started talking. What would normally be a years-long negotiation with the groups lasted what? Nine months, six, nine months, maybe. Less than a year. We already have concurrence from the agencies. We already have everything signed off. Everybody's agreed. So by gathering around the table and doing it, we've done it in less than a year. What used to take years. Now all we got to do is find the money. But that's the big question. <laughs> And as you see, that, uh, that project is, it says 215, but as uh, Commissioner Beaumont and I were talking about earlier, that was 215 when this paper was printed. And if it was printed two hours ago, it's not 215 anymore. There's no telling what it'll be when we get done. But uh, we're going to keep going. In the back, these are too small to really be able to see on the projection, but you can look in here and see what is in our paving plan. These are not listed by year, because what we need you to know is we have approximately three years' worth of paving out there. Is that right, Dave and Randy? We've got contracts that have been for three years. Some are should have already been done, and they're not, because the contract's behind. Some we've just awarded them to be out there, but these are the roads that are currently scheduled to be resurfaced or treated in Currituck County. And that would be something you can share with your constituents. If somebody asks, you actually have what's currently under contract. Um, so I have to hit you up about 12 in Corolla. That's my district, and it looks like some kid threw some pavement on the, with a shovel out there and <laughs> put some rumble strips on. <clears throat> well, some of it was uh, was patched. I mean, right. it, it, I, it actually was just patched, but that's what it was. But now, Ronnie, I believe there was a – I will let you address real quick. We, we need to go to Bob up there. Come on now. Come up so you can give them, I'm, I'm give aware. Them. I'm aware of the condition up there, and, it's, right. and then we're, we're trying. We're trying to get, get some of that patching done in a, in a better way with a mechanical patching for right. the road width. The, the intent was to get it done before Memorial Day, and we're, we're still going to try. But we had some setbacks with the Northeaster, and getting it contractually done. That's kind of set us back. I know we're kind of at a, at a tough deadline, and mm -hmm. we're going to try to handle it with the contractor, what we call our spot paving contract. It's kind of an on-call contract that we use. It's going to be tight, but we're, 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 we've been trying this effort for about six weeks. And Anyway, the, the goal is to get the worst places pulled over with the paver before Memorial Day. I know the traffic's up there. It's tough yeah, for me. That's with pretty bad. My daughter worked up there last year, but um, that's the intent. To, okay. Uh, and, and and then it's on a paving uh, plan, but I think that is two years out. So what we want to do is do some mechanical patching for the tourist season, and then if there's anything we need to address beyond that, hopefully that'll last for the tourist season. If there's anything we need to address beyond that, we may can do some more in the fall. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know one of the questions that was brought up in the public was, was drainage. Um, <laughs> Ronnie's division maintenance engineer and Jim the county maintenance engineer. They are the point people for that. Um, specifically, I mean, I know the area that was that was questioned. I don't know the status of whether, you know, what the status of the ditches were. Um, there was mention about an easement. Very seldom DOT doesn't have permanent drainage easements. DOT, his drainage policy is, we are a landowner in the watershed like everybody else is. We have to deal with our water that falls in the right of way. That's our land. Just like if you have a watershed district, you get taxed based on your acreage in the watershed. DOT is a participant and a member of the watershed. So is everybody else that lives in the watershed, and their land contributes to the runoff in the watershed. Now, there may have been a very nice ditch at some point in the past when that culvert was put in. I'm, I'm thinking when 168, well, when 158 was widened and built and increased, you know, there may have been a large ditch there. We're having this issue across the whole division because drainage is everybody's responsibility. If you live in the watershed and you're served by the ditch, then, you know, you're, you're part of that drain, drainage that goes through that watershed or through that ditch. And over time, a lot of people got to the point they didn't, nobody maintained it. We have farmland back in Northampton County. We spend 
we spend our own resources to keep that drainage in that farm so that farmland is viable. If we didn't, it wouldn't be viable. So we will, we've written it down. We'll go back and check that specific drainage issue that was brought up and determine if, if there's anything that involves the right-of-way or DOT's facilities or pipelines or whatnot are not functioning, you know, we'll, we'll rectify that. If we find that it's an off-site issue, an off-right-of-way issue, we'll let y'all know what our determinations are. And could you, either way, could you probably, whatever your findings are, oh, we, yeah. yeah, let that, get that to Leanne so she can get it to us and we yeah, get it to Yes, no, we will okay, respond great. to, we respond <clears throat> to the board as to what the findings are. Okay. And if, for example, we've done this in other places, if a, if a group gets together and decides we're going to do a big, clean out, you know, we need to clean this ditch out and all the landowners get together and chip in and DOT is a contributor to that. We can't contribute with private parties, but if, for example, let's just say 10 or 12 people that live in that watershed want to get together and clean that big canal out, they would probably need to come to the county or some entity through the county and say, we want to do this. Somebody would get an estimate. They'd say, okay, it cost $5,000 to clean the ditch out. Well, Everybody pays their pro rata share based on their acreage in the watershed. DOT is completely willing to contribute our share of the watershed. You know, we can do a reimbursement agreement with the county, and we will pony up our part. <coughs> but we're, we're not going to pass the buck. We will literally, we will pass the buck. We will pass the bucks to whoever's holding the agreement if it's something that's determined is we're a part of the watershed. So... We will investigate that drainage, though. We'll find out where the issue may be, and we will respond to the board accordingly so you'll know where we stand. Okay. I think one of the concerns we've heard is uh, DOT used to clean the ditches out, and now they don't do that anymore. We, and, you know, and that, is, that, is, that, is there truth to that statement? Is, was it a mis misrepresentation and someone that, didn't understand? The language was re-added into part of, and I'm trying to remember what the, the language or the verbiage is that, Ditch cleanout is got added back in and and specified as part of the responsibilities, but it's not sole responsibility on DOT. Right. But so it, that, but that, that, but that's you know that's what we're hearing tonight. And then and the question is 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 it a DOT ditch? Is it the customer's ditch? Is there is it both of their ditches? If it's in their yard, it's you know. As I explained, our our, our drainage policy, which which when we respond, what we'll do is we'll send a copy of that too. Our drainage policy states that we are, like I said, we are members of the watershed. And North Carolina is what they call a receiver state. If you live downstream, you have to accept the water that comes to you and then cope with it and pass it on to the downstream landowner accordingly. You can't stop it. You can't impede it and affect your upstream neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. And, that's, and that gets into the legal right? ramification of riparian rights and all that, and we don't need to go there today. But, yes, DOT, DOT used to do a lot of things that DOT doesn't do anymore. I'm going to be honest. I've, I've been here 31 years. There was a time you'd see an excavator so far across the field, you couldn't even tell whose it was. And if you got close enough, it had that triskelion on the side of it, didn't it? You're not going to see that anymore. One thing, I, one former division engineer said, we don't have the resources nor the funding to do things we used to do. It just it doesn't exist. We just don't have it. We have to concentrate on what we have to deal with, which is essentially the right-of-way line to the right-of-way line. But if there is an issue downstream and it is affecting us and we are contributing water to the watershed, yes, we will be a participant in that. Now, I do know that Representative Goodwin was trying to get some legislation passed that dealt with drainage and agriculture and all sorts of stuff. And I don't know what the final, I don't know if it ever really passed. I don't know what it became of that, but I do know he was working on it. Mm -hmm. But um, as of right now, we are, we are landowners in the watershed, just like whoever else lives in the watershed. And we will be a participant in the watershed. Good. Uh, Chairman Pamey, can I ask a Go question? Go ahead. Um, you mentioned those turnouts um, that uh, are common um, in other parts. Would that work for the, the southern, for Edgewater <laughs> Road? Because of 
between um, one road, which is New Beach Road, all the way up to Edgewater Road, there are 13 different access points. Yeah. To I don't know how even a turn turnabout is a divided median, perhaps a, uh, an op well, an that, opportunity to stop some of the as well, Miss Harris. Well, that's about. what it is. You the median would come out. You would take the median out. You'd have two lanes going that way, two lanes going that way, and you'd either have the, the median would either be taken out and mm -hmm. turned back to a vegetation, or it would have some kind of island or barrier in it. Is 17, that also an 17 South, like you're going to New Bern? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. What I know I'm exactly saying. what. Yeah. But uh, a median, uh, I know Gates down Channel. in Dare County where the um, intersection of Kitty Hawk Road and uh, Highway 168 with the post office. Yeah, they yeah, yeah, the right issue. there at the 7-Eleven, yeah. Right, they had the same issue with people right. pulling out and there's a concrete median. We, and that's what Perhaps it would Perhaps that would be a quicker, shorter-term solution for the dangerous intersection that is Edgewater Road. If you put a camera on that road, you would see at every hour a near miss. And I, I, um, it's, been, it's been less than a week that I've had one. And I wouldn't even pretend to doubt that. Because I mean, I was at the beach this weekend, this Thursday and Friday, and came back Saturday. And as I was coming back this way, there was a mass influx going that way. Mm -hmm. Both lanes, as far as I could see, going that way. Now I saw a gap once in a while, but after that, it was like wall to wall going. But that's the safest we have our roads when it stopped going. Well, south, yes, because nobody's running. It's because everybody's running 20 mile an hour, not Absolutely. 60. Or and 70. Trying to make a left-hand uh, turn yeah. or even a right, even if you're deciding to go right, can be yeah. dangerous because of people it, it is. going it's tight. in a hundred different directions. And, and as a, the, the big term is access management. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it, there was a time that access management was a cuss mm -hmm. word. You could get run out of a meeting in a minute when you're talking about access management. You're going to take my media night. Nobody can turn and come to my business. Well, nobody's coming to your business if they're scared they're going to get run over either. Right. So, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Yeah, yes. So I, so I had kind of like three things to ask you. One of them, um, probably two, three years ago, DOT, we had a verbal commitment to participate in the Benito Road, Benito, right, road in Kerala with uh, part of the stormwater. Um, things happened yeah. and, you know, but any idea if that will ever become a possibility again? DOT's participation, because it's DOT's yeah. road we're trying to fix. I know, and, and, and funding was the, there was none. Um, I wouldn't even dare to answer that. Okay, so that. no breath holding there. <laughs> um, I wouldn't even pretend to try to give you an answer yet. The second one was, and I think um, I had reported it to um, Ike and I believe Commissioner Jarvis as well, uh, the repaving that was going on when they were doing the milling uh -huh. and the failure to clean up the millings or the, whatever they were using to sweep the streets you know, they needed a new brush or something because I got more reports of broken windshields at, from uh, opposite traveling. So you can't even yeah. say they were following too close. Right. Um, uh, you know, at my daughter's work, which is down south, a lady lost two windshields in the same week, mm. got it replaced, and it took another shot. And I know it got better, but what kind of um, observation quality control is going on, you know, during a contractor's performance on that? Well, or lack thereof. Well, milling by nature creates I get it. residual material. It's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Now, and this was a little different because as far as the scheduling goes, historically you mill and you, oh, you come almost right behind it with the paper. And and if I state this wrong, I'm going to ask David or Randy to speak up. I think what the story was, as I said, we have contracts. We have contractors that have contracts that should have been done already and hadn't even started. So that's how far the industry is behind. Workforce, various and sundry things, you know, it's just the way it is. We allowed them, the milling, op, the milling operation is a subcontractor. He had an opening in his schedule. 
he was able to come and go ahead and mill that open graded friction course that was raveling so bad, he was able to mill that off. Now, you know, they're putting this top back on it. Historically, that would be almost like a daily one behind the other. Had, they, had we not allowed them to come in, the milling operation was delayed until when? August? August. So that meant the whole project would have been delayed to August, and we'd have been dealing with that raveling that was causing all the complaints to start with. So, yes, it, I'm not going to say that the sweeping or the residuals or stuff that pops well, once, up. Once we brought it up, I, I will tell you, there was a market improvement. Yeah. So if it, like, the next day. Right. So I don't and, know and we, if it we was. Sent, we sent folks out there to, to clean it up, and, you know, you mill it and you sweep it and everything's okay. Well, traffic right. runs on it, and that stuff begins to, loose you know, enough. the little loose stuff comes out, and it accumulates in the median or in the wheel pass, and then somebody crosses the lane and picks up a handful, and there it goes. But I get it. Seeing it, seeing it in that condition for that length of time is not a normal operation, but it was because if we didn't do it, we were going to be way down in the summer before we ever even touched it. And we were having so many complaints with the raveling that was going on with the existing surface anyway we thought it best to go on and at least get that off. But, yeah, you, we've handled it. And then the final thing is kind of a, a shout-out to uh, the engineering support at DOT. And um, I'm going to bring up H2OBX. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this has to do with the engineering aspect, the science associated with yeah. how traffic works. I don't think, well, whoever – Every member of the Board of Commissioners was positive H2OBX was going to be a traffic <laughs> accident nightmare. And, and it would, we need a light. I can't believe there's not going to be a light. Yeah. What is DOT thinking, right? And I can yeah. tell you I took at least one, probably a lot more than that, emails that, what are they kidding me? And, and I, will, I will suggest to you that I think the facts – and, I mean, there's been an accident there, but I don't think well, you can blame it on the fact that there was no light as much as texting and driving. Right, right, right. Right. So, but, but the science worked, and yeah. I, I, I was stunned at how mm -hmm. there has not been the level of accidents I ever would have dreamed. Well, because we, traffic stopped further down for the accident. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, hey, we'll, Thank you, Edgewater. We'll take the attaboy wherever we can get right, right, um, right, right. But we appreciate that. And, yes, we did mine a camera there. You remember the temporary camera on the path? We mounted one there for the express purpose of watching to see what was going to happen. Because if it was, if something else went south, we were prepared to have to do something. But uh, just to follow up with the Edgewater and 158 south end of the county, um, would DOT are you even considering looking at that a study or? Or is there even, do you see a necessity, or necessi no. necessity. necessity to um, address all the accidents that are happening we there? Will, or? We will go back and we'll go back and forward it to the, our regional traffic engineers okay. and the experts that do these studies, and they study these locations, and they're the experts that know, okay, this type of accidents, this many, this traffic, this configuration, they know that. And we trust them to tell us. Would they what be the ones you? that put the camera? Because I think a camera at that location would speak well, volumes, volumes. We'll, we'll, we'll take that. I mean, if we still have a spare camera, I don't mind asking our traffic unit to see if we can place one somewhere that won't be a problem, but it would last some observation. Now, the one thing about our cameras, don't, the cameras don't record. They're live. You can view them. Mm -hmm. But they don't, sure. they don't record. So it's, you're not going to get a a recordation of days of traffic but and then it's just then a follow-up to that um there's been some some concerns and maybe you know this as well is that the lighting there at times mm -hmm. when you go to turn you yeah. can't see the road yeah. ditches if, if a, i mean would the study or someone determine if if a light would help illuminate that area for turning with because a lot of people go into the ditch yeah. what's that so like dominion, dominion power, power would have to put that on there yeah now it, that, that yeah the lighting like that is out of DOT's range. Okay, all right. So we're that address. that would be you might could ask Dominion to look. Okay. Can you put street lighting in this vicinity or on a couple of poles or something? DOT. I don't know what the criteria are, but okay. I know that there are criteria that this will never meet. It's so the lighting is not on us. Okay, but now I wouldn't doubt being able to see 
Obviously, you can see the radius, you see an attorney, and you know you can tell where you are. It's, it'd be fine. But that would be something for the county to ask Dominion. Okay. Would you All mind right. putting up a street light okay. or we'll two do that then. at this intersection? Okay. Because there are other street lights all up and down that corridor. Okay. I mean, why not? What's the that difference? One, one or right. two. We'll one thing. One thing too. In some of this, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may ask, the you know, in some of the wrecks and the fatals, obviously not as a commissioner, but my other position, a lot of those wrecks. I mean, there's we've had some of our most recent fatals. We've had a lot of medical situations or stuff. Yeah. Huge, you know, factors. Which, not just that, but I mean, like far as grown-up people if you got a valid driver's license in the state of north carolina and you drive these roads people need to drive the roads like they have some some sense <laughs> the best i mean not trying to be ugly but i mean you i mean i, I rode a guy last summer for doing a hundred on 158. Yeah. you know i mean and like i said it's just that bridge is not going to fall apart for somebody to get to dare county and the level of respect i think of some people when they go out there on the roads it's ridiculous in today's times and people should be ashamed of themselves on that you know, far as, but, and the, another note of that, I, like our local office, if I call Reggie Saunders and we need yeah. something, Reggie responds, he fixes, he helps. Yeah. David Ott's been awesome. Okay. Uh, you guys do a good, I mean, and I know your resources are limited, but I mean, I've rode those roads in Virginia and I'll take NCDOT <laughs> over a VDOT any day of the week. Gotcha. Oh, and you said you had, um, of course. Thank you. 34 <laughs> from Snowden Road through Shawboro. They did not pave it when they repaved the other sections of it, mainly because of the drainage culverts under the road. That's correct. They need to be enlarged. Where are we at on that project? It's been two years now, Kitty, or three? Three. Three. I, I I'm going to turn. I believe our hydro didn't determine that there was size issues, correct? Yeah, I think that's right. And we put that gap. Yeah. Back in the paving plan, I don't know how. I don't know what year it's in. We're, we're going, going to fill the gap back in. But we will probably be filled in when you repave the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, our, our hydro unit. Our hydro unit did an extensive study of that area, and the culverts under, yeah. under, it, well, in Shawboro yeah. proper, so to speak, the size was adequate. But they haven't been cleaned out well, in my lifetime. When did we? They were cleaned up two years ago. We cleaned them out two, two years, years ago. Harvey came to us, and we got it on conversation. And we cleaned it. We cleaned the dishes out, cleaned the driveway pipes out, and cleaned the cross lines out. In Shawboro? Yes, you sir. did not. Uh -huh. <laughs> you did I farm <laughs> on that. I farm on one road, the Maple Knoll Road, and the p culvert pipe is breaking in. That was not. Oh, they well. did do some clean out on some of it, but I don't oh. think they went as and far. I don't well, okay, well, we cleaned out some places that he put his finger on. I'll be honest. Well, we did clean some of them out. And if, and if Jim, Jim can go up there and go ahead, Ron. I think we did both sides of the road all the way through um, from the Indian town where the intersection goes, uh, begins at, where Indian town has in, all the way to Snowden Road. I'm not going to disagree with you, but it must have been a stealth operation. <laughs> Don't make a sick Harvey on you. Okay. We'll go back and check on you. <laughs> I do know they did a good job from Snowden Road back, oh. or from the school from the school east back towards the stoplight on 168. 168. From that area was was I, I do remember them being out there, and I don't know if weather or something where it didn't. I don't believe it went where they were both discussing. Well, we, we can check, and I All know right. the biggest this, issue okay. that we had was much like we had that they mentioned down here on 158 around the Newburn's pit is the outlet ditches. They don't exist like they used to. They're growing up in trees. People have built houses right up beside them. You can't, you couldn't get in and clean out a machine if you wanted to. So, and we said, you know, if somebody's going to clean these out, we'll help by making sure the cross lines and driveways work. But we can have a pipe on the road clean as this table right here. If it has nowhere to go, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. have anywhere to go. So. Kitty, do you have a question? I have a comment, something yeah. that bothers me greatly. We talk okay. about people rushing to get to Dare County. Yeah. You come into North Carolina, there at Mayock, there's this big sign up there. Dare County, 30 miles away, you'll be there in 45 minutes. Uh, 
that bothers me. Why are we telling people in Curry Tuck County you need to speed to get <laughs> go faster to get to Dare County? I realize those signs should be used for if there's a wreck or something down the highway, but when they're telling people how much further it is to get to Dare County and how many minutes, it just makes them speed that much more. And also, we need to mark our roads better at night if it's raining. I think that causes a lot of accidents too because there's no lines on the road anymore. That's right, and on 12. That's my comment. Okay. Noted. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm not well, going to argue with you. No, I'm not going to okay. argue with you. I mean, <laughs> change those signs. Okay. And, I, and I, don't know what, I don't know why. I know they're up there, and I know that a lot of that stuff is a lot of that stuff is noted in advance. Just like if you go into Raleigh, there are signs that say, you know, how far Channel it is to time. here. You go into Virginia, you know, it tells you that from here to the, from there to the tunnel is this, and the delays are here. I mean, that's, it's, it's done for traffic control and traffic flow. It's why it's noted that way. Uh, because if there, for example, was a major impediment down there and there was a big delay, you tell people like that because maybe they, of course, down here there's nowhere else to go. That's the only way in and out. But a lot of times you'll try and find another right, you know, if, if you mm -hmm. see there's a major issue. But uh, we'll look at it and see. I mean, I'll take it under Miss anyway. Kitty, it's like a challenge, I guess, to them to see if they can beat the time. All right. So, <laughs> so is there, I mean, I hate to say we, I tell you, okay. yeah. Is there any other um, questions? Um, well, as you can see, we don't get you get you here that often. We, so no, we, we, we intend to be more okay. present than a lot we of, have been. Okay. Well, a lot of our constituents have been asking us and questions and well, so, but this, I think you've answered some of them. You've heard some of the concerns, yeah. and uh, we look forward to getting some feedback on some of these issues, and and uh, that way we can take it back to the constituents and, and keep them informed of what's going on. So, well, um, thank you. yeah. Well, thank so I just yeah thank everyone for coming this evening. Um, we were uh, excited to get you here, and I'm sure the people listening and watching or watching us later will be. Uh, thank you for your time, and yep. we will make it a point to not be so far in between business. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah. Take a, a break. Yeah. Let's take a five-minute uh, recess, really quick, and uh, get back here in five minutes. Thank you. Annual budget presentation for uh, fiscal year 2020 to 2023 by our county manager, Mike McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 159-11, I'm presenting to you as budget officer the recommended fiscal year 2022-23 budget for Curry Tuck County. Under the North Carolina uh, Local Government and Fiscal Control Act, a balanced budget uh, <coughs> must be presented to the Board of Commissioners by June 1, uh, and a balanced budget must be adopted by June 30th. The budget that is being presented to you tonight is balanced as required by law using the current property tax rate of 46 cents per $100 of assessed valuation. One of the major purposes for the county's annual budget is to develop a fiscally responsible plan that accomplishes the Board of Commissioners' priorities and furthers its strategic vision. In prior retreats and work sessions with staff, this board has established the following themes that this budget seeks uh, seeks to respond to. First of all, uh, that the county would maintain quality and efficient services, continue its partnership with Curry Tuck County Schools using an agreed formula to fund uh, school uh, appropriations and capital construction <coughs> needs, uh, to increase pay for all employees, to retain and recruit quality employees and soften economic pressures they are experiencing and to enhance the county's infrastructure uh, to address and prepare for continued development and population growth. Uh, this recommended budget will move the county forward, I believe, in achieving those stated goals and purposes. It is also one of the major responsibilities of the board uh, to develop and establish the fiscal, uh, the fiscal uh, plan for the county as you carry forth your philosophy on how you intend to see the county grow and develop. Our annual, annual balanced budget consists of 27 different funds. It's not just one fund, but an amalgamation of funds 
that we put together. As we get into the general fund discussion, I first want to note that th this recommended budget comes at a time when the board uh, in Curry Tuck County is experiencing uh, Curry Tuck as one of the fastest growing counties in North Carolina, rivaling the growth scene in the Raleigh, Durham, and Charlotte metro areas. The United States Census Bureau tells us that, it, that there was a recorded 19.3% population increase in the county between 2010 and 2020. By contrast, the state of North Carolina population increased 9.5%. The North Carolina Office of State Budget and Management projects an additional 29% population increase for Curry Tuck County from 2020 to 2040. Much of the county's growth, as we know, is occurring within the Moyoc community, which is expected to experience a construction of an additional 2,200 housing units by 2030. Growth is often viewed as progress and opportunity, but growth can strain the county's financial resources. As one of three counties in the state with no municipalities, the county funds services that are traditionally provided by municipalities within other counties. This additional responsibility places greater financial burden on the county to maintain and provide critical infrastructure, public safety response, human services, and capital for school needs. Going forward in the coming fiscal year, fiscal year and as a proactive response to expected growth and demand on county resources, the board can expect uh, to develop and adopt a multi-year capital improvement plan uh, going forward and further as the county enters the beginning of a, another two-year uh, budget cycle, uh, the board can expect to spend more time with staff evaluating and providing vision for the county's strategic response to issues related to growth. Now the recommended budget totals $126,914,856 for all county operations. The general fund is uh, 68,000, dollars $68, of that amount. <coughs> the general fund is a fund through which education, human services, public safety, community services, planning, and general government is provided. It's primarily supported by the property tax, sales tax, and other general purpose revenues. Yep. Can you back up? Steve? Yes, I've got a, we've got a head there. That one right there. I just wanted to point out that um, you know we're still the ninth lowest tax rate out of 100 counties in the state of North Carolina. That no, kind of went through quickly. So well, we're gonna we're gonna slow up and, and show that. Okay. Um, <laughs> for, first of all, our tax base valuation because the the greatest part of our funding resource is the property tax. Um, we 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 rely upon the uh, real, the valuation of our real property. And so our real property valuation has grown over the last fiscal year by 0.03% so that we, are, we now have a real uh, property valuation of $8.229 billion in Curry Tuck County. As you can see, it, we, we continue to, to be now on an upward trend after having gone down slightly. Um, or earlier in the previous decade. This is an interesting slide also to see the tax base by region in Curry Tuck County. We've, we've often, or some have measured uh, the county's tax base by um, the, the beach properties versus the mainland properties. The last fiscal year you may have uh, recalled that the uh, mainland was at that point in time 51% of the assessed value in Curry Tuck County with the beach about 49 uh, percent. Now you can see that in, in this coming fiscal year it's anticipated that there will be again a 50-50 even split, although we would anticipate that, that in the next fiscal year following the coming one uh, that with the growth that's going on in the mainland that we will see that shift again uh, to, to there being more assessed value uh, in the, on the mainland. As Commissioner White pointed out, our property tax rate is uh, proposed to re remain at 46 cents, which continues a stable uh, tax rate that we've been able to enjoy for a, a good number of years. Yeah, because I, I know back in the 80s it was like a dollar five or something, 
Yes. Yeah, it was and way up there. So we've been come a long way since the 80s. That's right. It's been and stable since yes. 95. Yes. That's right. And the services yes. for the 46 cent, you can't compare it to anywhere. No. Yeah, the county, the county has been very fortunate to be able to yeah. provide the services that it has over the years. Uh, and as Commissioner White pointed out, that uh, Curry Tuck County, we are uh, the ninth uh, lowest tax rate uh, in the state, the average state uh, tax rate being almost 68 cents for $100. And just uh, a question, uh, that was a point you mentioned earlier, of those counties that you got listed under lowest, are any of those also without municipalities? Well, that's an important point uh, <laughs> because we often only look at the county tax rate and don't take into consideration the municipal rate uh, that may also should be added to those county rates. So I believe all of those counties that are they all have municipalities with, with as the lowest certainly have municipalities. And so uh, this does not truly reflect what a citizen in one of those counties uh, would pay if they live within a municipality in their county. Just go two counties over. That's correct. Pasquotain. Their, their uh, town tax rate is equal to the county tax rate. Right. And like you said, in Dare too, almost all of Dare, you know, they're having a, a municipality. So this is a, just a uh, illustration of the Curry Tuck County tax rate versus the average state uh, tax rate over the oh. years. It's like a Tetris graph. <laughs> Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't leave that one alone. <laughs> and again, our, ours will remain uh, consistent with the with, with the last year's uh, tax rate. Uh, this slide shows the general fund revenue sources for the county. As I said a moment ago, property tax is 54 percent of the largest portion of the revenue base uh, for the county. I would note that fund balance uh, is also being appropriated, proposed for appropriation in this budget in the amount of $2,366,921. Um, it is the 39, that is a 39% lower appropriation than was appropriated uh, from fund balance in the current fiscal year budget. It's also noteworthy that the fiscal year 21 fund balance, and that's the last uh, audit that we received, ended the fiscal year in the total amount of $35,113,845. That's for all fund balances that comprise the county's budgets. Uh, un unassigned, unassigned fund balance at the end of fiscal year 21 was $20,953,942, which was an impressive increase of $9,889,055 in unrestricted fund balance. But re remember, <coughs> That, Bless you. that growth in fund balance was appropriated in this current fiscal year uh, to fund school capital construction. <clears throat> Why do we have a fund balance? We have a fund balance uh, in order to um, be able to provide for operations and cash flow uh, for uh, basically three months is what the local government commission likes counties to maintain, uh, which is about 8%. <laughs> Uh, of your operating budget. Um, for coastal counties and communities, of course, the local government commission and certainly rating agencies that rate uh, debt want to see a, a greater uh, fund balance um, somewhere in the 20 to 30 percent range, and so that's what we seek to maintain. Um, that, that's another area in which I, I want the board to engage in the coming fiscal year for us to, to evaluate and truly establish a fund balance policy as many other communities have done so that we don't maintain too much fund balance, but we don't maintain too little as well. But that should be a, a board considered and adopted policy in my view. So uh, again, again, looking at our assessed value um, and our projected levy, we see that from our assessed valuation of real property and motor vehicles, uh, based on a 46 six cents tax rate uh, that our projected net levy of tax revenue uh, for the coming fiscal year is anticipated to be $37,505,112. Um, and that's based on a over an over 99% uh, tax collection rate. We can always do better and reach 100, but we 
uh, do pretty pretty well among counties at, at over a 99% tax collection rate. Okay. <clears throat> this uh, slide shows the general fund appropriations by departmental function. As you can see, public safety, that's uh, sheriff's office, uh, fire and EMS, uh, uh, receive approximately 38% of the county's appropriations with education coming in behind at 24%, um, general government at 17%. But, but, but another important aspect of this slide is that this also represents people who work for the citizens of Curry Tuck County and for this board in carrying out um, the county operations. And, and so as part of this uh, budget, there is proposed, um, because competitive competitiveness has become uh, increasingly difficult in what appears to be a lasting post-pandemic trend. Um, we are proposing $1,615,164 to fund the following. Uh, implementation of the third phase of the board engaged compensation study as recommended by the county's consultant Gallagher. Implementation of a $15 per hour minimum pay for all full-time positions. We have some hard, hard-working employees uh, whose positions only pay them uh, maybe $11 um, per hour, in some cases less, and we and so uh, appreciate the board's willingness, uh, at least in work sessions, to increase at least the, the minimum pay to $15 per hour. Uh, also, would, would adjust pay, pay grades to prevent salary compression, which provides all full-time employees with not less than 4% increase to base salary. Proposes to increase the starting salaries for the deputy trainee position, deputy certified position, and senior deputy position to enhance the sheriff's office recruitment for quality law enforcement officers, and to also uh, cover the increase in employer retirement system contribution rate. Um, there has been a lot of talk by this board, um, and thoughtfully so, that county employees ought to receive a, a, a cost of living adjustment, particularly given the economic times, and there's not been a cost of living adjustment, at least in the last fiscal year. Um, what this budget will do is will take funds for a cost of living adjustment um, and other funds in order to meet these goals that I just listed in order to, uh, to recognize our employees for the, for the hard work that they do. The, the other part of this is, is for competitiveness, as I mentioned, because currently we have 28 vacancies uh, in county positions, not just the sheriff's office, which also has its own issues with regard to uh, recruitment, but also other general, in general government positions are vacant, and the county is having difficulty in receiving applications for qualified candidates, most notably the project engineer position in the county engineer department. Um, we have received no applications. Does that that doesn't include the part time neither? That's just the full time, correct? That's correct. Okay, because I mean we have a bunch of the part time too. Right. <laughs> this slide then shows the general fund appropriations by type. Um, you notice that this slide it shows a little bit more education appropriation. That's because this slide includes the county's almost a quarter of a million dollar contribution to College of the Albemarle. We participate with other area counties in helping to fund. Uh, that very strong community college and its programs. This slide shows the largest uh, general fund appropriations or largest departments of uh, Curry Tuck County Schools, of course, uh, is $14,478,302. The funding of local school current expense uh, comes from an agreed school funding formula plus uh, the addition this year of a 4.7 consumer price index multiplier. Uh, which results in a recommended local current expense appropriation in the amount of $13,078,302, which is $444,202 more than appropriated in the current fiscal year. The capital expense funding for the schools is recommended in the amount of $1,400,000 for the total appropriation as appears on the screen before you. The pupil enrollment projection for fiscal year 23 is 4,641 students, which is an increase uh, of 421 students over the current fiscal year projection. 
Uh, and so the bottom line is that the local current expense per student will increase by $126.48 uh, from this year's $2,691.01 per student to, to uh, $2,817.49 per student. Mr. Manager, we, um, what, do, what do we rank on that far as the funding of the students? Aren't we, I know there's 115 districts. What are we, like 19th? No, no we're in the top 10. Are we the top 10? I, I, so. I, I don't recall right offhand. I think we're pretty close. I, I think we're in the right top there. 25. I think we're. No, we're, we're higher than that. Are we really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Top yeah. 15. That's yeah. still strong. Yeah, very that's strong. strong. I mean, uh, yeah. which, yeah, that, and that's why I wanted that noted. Yep. Thank you. Uh, before I mention, uh, these are new county uh, positions that are proposed uh, in, in this budget. Um, but it's also uh, notable that uh, there is one department and position that is being um, ended in, in this budget proposal, and that's the Economic Development Department. But uh, the, the, the board, I think you, the board understands, but I want the public to understand that that does not mean that the county is no longer in the economic development business that the county does not want to see and welcome new business growth within the county um, or that the county does not want to see uh, our existing businesses continue to grow and prosper. Um, what, what this is is a, an idea that perhaps we can move away from an, an older model of economic development that I've seen throughout my 30-some year career in other communities that just almost seems stale and is not working. Um, there is always a belief that an attempt to, to hit a home run and bring a big manufacturing plant like Alto or mm -hmm. something like that into a community. And we know that just doesn't happen uh, anymore. We also, I think, understand that if a market is right, uh, a business is going to come to your community uh, because it makes sense to them and it makes sense to them financially. No matter how much talking you do mm -hmm. and glad handing you do with them is not going to in and of itself bring a business into your community. Um, and, and, and so what, what, what we want to also look at is not just always trying to hit the home run or always trying to get outside business to come in, but why not try to find a way to focus on our existing businesses to help them expand, to grow, uh, to employ more of our citizens. And I think that's important to you give, start looking some more support because I think our local businesses want to grow and expand. and having a new focus to work with our existing businesses in the county here, I think is a is a win-win for everybody. Certainly. And, and so we, we also see that there's opportunity for our, our existing departments to become more engaged in what, in essence, is economic development activity and encouragement. Uh, a prime example is our, is our airport. Uh, that is becoming more and more uh, an attraction and, and a base from which uh, Curry Tuck County's story and how we are open for business and encouraging business growth and development is being uh, given and received. Uh, our current airport manager and his staff are, are talking to, to all types of people from all over the country who are flying in and out of our airport. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and note, as, as the board knows, that uh, part of that operation has turned around to the point that our airport now is making uh, making money. I mean, we're bringing, it's bringing in revenue. Uh, rather than in the red as it always had been in, in, in its entire existence. So, I mean, it's like the airport's its own separate economic development entity. It's an engine. It's an engine. <laughs> but it is. But we have, we have other departments that can also engage in economic development um, uh, through the manner in which it facilitates uh, such growth, uh, w whether that's the development services department, planning department. Uh, there are many other county departments uh, engaging more with the Chamber of Commerce. So. So we, we are not closed for business by any means by removing the Economic Development Department as a funded agency within this budget. Uh, we, we are going to look for, for new dynamic ways to encourage uh, economic development and growth within While you're on that account. subject, <laughs> I got an email the other day from uh, the individuals I was talking to you about about doing <coughs> yes. some time. And uh, so they're ready to proceed with uh, something. So I'll be getting with you with that. But I, I proposed to the board at some time ago about getting getting a mainland website really designed for businesses and central planning calendars um, a place to go find events centrally located and and have it part of our economic development mm -hmm. engine so um, 
that's what I'm talking about. But we're going to be I'm getting good. together with the county good. manager, get that moved forward. Hopefully, sounds good. Uh, the county, like you said, like he said too on that. Like I mean, the, the, just these last few events. I mean, some of them are county, the Bulls and Barbecue, the right. whatever. I mean, the, the event that Will yeah. uh, had over there at his place. I mean, the, these events they used to have like 60 to 80 people. There's like mm. thousands. Yep. I mean, they're I mean, and that's social media. Uh, you know, where people are spreading the word and people want to go out and do something. There's certainly a great opportunity here on the mainland, and, and, and as Commissioner White said, that's what we've been talking about, moving forward to uh, to see if we can't help grow uh, activity and business here on the mainland. The operating budget uh, for utilities, um, of course, you see here on the screen that there are proposed rate increases throughout our enterprise funds. Uh, you will recall that these are rate increases that the board has previously approved after a study and analysis of our rate structures. And so as implemented by the board, uh, we are continuing with that, uh, that process. The total budget presented to you is an $88,265 uh, decrease over the current fiscal year, uh, but the original budget uh, and the revised budget uh, which uh, it, it had extra money put into it through the, uh, a lot of it was schools, of course, through the acquisition of uh, $1 million of mobile units uh, for the school system, as well as the almost $21 million uh, renovation and expansion projects that are occurring at Moyock Elementary uh, and uh, Moyock Middle School. But in any event, um, we, we, even taking into account the revised budget, this proposed budget is $29,675,159 decrease over the current fiscal year. So we, we are maintaining uh, our, our funding and, and our tax rate uh, in this proposed budget. Ike? Okay, that looks like, and I may have misheard what you just, I may have misheard what you just said. Yeah, I see there's a 29, it's a 29 million, million, million dollar decrease that, over 21, 22. Uh, that, that is not. That, that is correct. Oh, that is gross. Okay, because 29. the original budget was passed, <coughs> then during the year you did budget. I mean, oh, okay, right. brought it up uh, to 158 mm -hmm. something million, I think. And because you funded the two school projects, Got it. you funded the million dollars, you carried forward some stuff that didn't get done okay. the year before. Can we pause like for like 10 minutes so people can snapshot <laughs> that at home for $30 social media? <laughs> you know, you're welcome. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I couldn't let that one go either. But I, Not Miss Reed. But yeah, I thought you so said 29. He did. I, I did say that. He did. He said, so, so, and I was counting along with him. Look at that. That looked like, <laughs> a, I'm like, one, two, three, four. That like a 29 million decrease. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, well, that's pretty strong. <laughs> so the, the, the next steps, um, tonight's the presentation of the budget is required by law. Uh, staff would ask that the board uh, hold a public hearing and possible, well, public hearing on the budget. I know there is uh, further discussion that is desired. Uh, by board members about the budget and you need time to review and digest uh, the budget and so we would, we would propose that following the public hearing on June 6th that you not adopt the budget that, that evening but that we in the intervening weeks between June 6th and your second meeting in in June have the opportunity for a budget another budget work session uh, for the board to to ask questions or make any modifications or refinements uh, to this proposed budget um, because this is not the end of the process, but really just the beginning of the process for the Board of Commissioners. And as, as the budget officer, I am now handing the budget recommended by me to you uh, for you to discuss, consider, refine, and, and do again as you see is appropriate for the fiscal policy of the county. And now I was going to say, but as far as us getting the copies and all that and going online, that's what's yes, the dates we, we, and all that. I apologize. We didn't have your workbooks tonight. We had some computer glitches or software glitches, which, which uh, we were not able to, to put that together for you. It will be posted uh, on the county's website tomorrow, and we can also make available to the board uh, thumb drives with the, the entire workbook on it, or if you would like hard copies, let us know that, and we can... We can do that as well. No, I'd like, I mean, thumb drive is fine with me. That way we get time to go through everything and look at it all. 
I have a question. So after we have the public hearing and then we have a workshop, you don't have to present that again no. to the public. No. Correct. This is this is my presentation to the board. It now becomes your budget uh, for you to consider and have additional work sessions, as many as you would like, in order that you become comfortable with the budget that you're about to adopt. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I do want to conclude that um, in this year of management transition, I certainly appreciate the board's uh, support and patience, um, but, uh, but I also uh, want to acknowledge uh, county staff and what I consider my finance team, uh, who without their able assistance would have made this budget preparation more difficult. Um, I, I think they probably thought it was difficult enough, as I know uh, Sandra Hill in particular, finance officer, and. Assistant Finance Officer Karen Krauss has spent many hours through the night, literally, um, working on getting this budget together uh, and balanced. I also want to thank uh, the Assistant to the County Manager, Rebecca Gay, and Human Resources Director, Melissa Futrell, for their professionalism, advice, and guidance throughout the, uh, throughout the process, which has enabled us to, again, put together and present to you a balanced budget for fiscal year 23. Okay. Thank you, and we look forward to getting those, I guess, thumb drives. Does everybody want a thumb drive? Does everybody want a hard copy? Thumb, thumb drive's good? Okay, so thumb drives, it is. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. McCree. Um, okay, the next item is um, going to be new business. Uh, item A, consideration of an ordinance amending Section 10-64 of the Code of Ordinance to provide for $75 civil penalty. I believe uh, county manager has this. Yes. Um, the General Assembly has yet again meddled with local government authority. And so what it has uh, done is provided that um, an ordinance penalty is not valid unless the penalty itself is specifically provided within the, or the ordinance. Um, <coughs> now what we have is a code of ordinances. And our code of ordinances, and th this county has done it for decades, as have many other counties in the state, as a general uh, provision and typically the first chapter that provides for the penalties for violation of an ordinance. And it may, might provide for the criminal penalty, it might provide for the civil penalty, it might provide for both criminal, criminal and civil penalties. Uh, but the General Assembly has now again adopted this legislation and this additional requirement for counties. Uh, and a recent Court of Appeals decision uh, seemed to uh, also make the same type of determination with regard to the placement and location of a penalty provision within an ordinance. Uh, so out of an abundance of caution, uh, this ordinance amendment will amend our beach uh, parking permit ordinance to provide uh, that there is a $75 civil penalty that is not, not deemed to be a misdemeanor infraction or criminal uh, penalty in any way uh, for violating the parking permit um, requirement. Uh, so uh, this, of course, is something that the board had already included uh, on the county's fee schedule, and the county staff would commend this to you for your approval. Okay, any questions from the board? Move for approval. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Okay, next item is item B, consideration for ordinance amending section 1064 of the Code of Ordinance, clarifying the area in which motor vehicles may operate on the beach and foreshore. I believe the county manager has this as well. Uh, th this ordinance amendment as proposed uh, merely strikes language which is deemed to be redundant as uh, it essentially provides for the same uh, thing in, in subparagraph C of section 1062 of the Code of Ordinances. Uh, after conversation with the sheriff, uh, he believed and I agree that it would be best to strike this language to make, uh, to clarify, make more clear uh, what the prohibition is uh, and to remove the unnecessary uh, redundancy. We commend this to the board for its approval. Any questions for discussions or questions? Make for motion. Approval. Move okay. Motion on the second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item is item C, the uh, consent agenda. Do you have any questions or do we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. At this time, I'll um, entertain a, a motion to adjourn our regular meeting. 
Second. Motion, the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And now I'll, I'll convene um, into the special meeting of the Tourism Development Authority, and I believe uh, for the budget, and I believe the county manager has that. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You are now sitting as the governing board for the Tourism <laughs> Development Authority. The Tourism Development Th Authority is a public authority created in 2004 by legislation of the General Assembly to promote travel and tourism in Currituck County. Um, the purpose for the Tourism Development Authority as set forth in that enabling legislation is that the Tourism Development Authority is to sponsor tourist-related events, finance tourist-related, and finance tourist-related capital projects in the county. So the occupancy tax and its history uh, originally, in 1987, uh, the county received enabling legislation from the General Assembly to assess a 3% occupancy tax, uh, which was to, to be utilized uh, or, or was amended in uh, 2004, uh, could be used only for tourism-related expenditures. In 1991, the county received additional enabling legislation to add an additional 1% uh, to the county's occupancy tax. Uh, and in 2004, uh, as with the original 3%, two-thirds was uh, required to be used to promote travel and tourism, and one-third of that additional 1% was to be utilized for tourism-related expenditures. And then again in 2004, in addition to the uh, specific uh, percentage or, or, or proportional uses of the occupancy tax, uh, the General Assembly gave the county authority to, en to enact an additional 2% occupancy tax with two-third of that to promote travel and tourism and one-third for tourism-related expenditures. And that's what it looks like with the original 3%, the 1% addition, and then the 2% addition in 2004. Uh, and so we, in, we have a, a, a anticipation of receiving $11,175,584 in uh, occupancy tax in total, uh, with the breakout, as you see, at $3.7 million to promote travel and tourism and seven, uh, almost $7.5 million to, to uh, promote tourism-related expenditures. So the part uh, of the tax that is required to be utilized for uh, to promote travel and tourism, the legislation defines what that means, and this is the uh, definition out of the legislation. Uh, to promote travel and tourism means to, to advertise or market an area or activity, publish and distribute pamphlets and other materials, basically to advertise uh, for travel and tourism uh, within the county. And that doesn't, doesn't just mean tourist. It means also, as you see, business travelers, and that's something that, uh, seems to be forgotten at times that is just not related to tourist and tourism but also to those who may be coming into or through our county on business this uh, slide shows uh, the percentage uh, of these monies that are used for promotions operation and personnel and so you see the vast majority two-thirds of these funds uh, for promotion and, uh, of travel and tourism are actually utilized for promotions a big part of that is 35% uh, for social media, and then going around the ring uh, lays out the other types of promotional activities that uh, are, are proposed to occur uh, in the coming fiscal year for the Tourism Development Authority. The part that's related to tourism-related expenditures, this, this also seems to have a lot of misunderstanding as to the ability uh, for using tourism-related expenditure do dollars. And I would point out, in particular, in the definition, which also comes from the legislation, that tourism-related expenditures are expenditures that, in the judgment of the Currituck County Board of Commissioners, in the judgment of the Currituck County Board of Commissioners, are designed to increase the use of lodging facilities meeting facilities, recreational facilities, and convention facilities in a county. Notice, in a county, not in a part of a county, not in a part of a county that where some believe that most of the revenue is generated in a county by attracting tourists or business travelers again, not just tourists, 
business travelers to the county. So as part of the uh, tourism related expenditure money, there is proposed to be budgeted as to historic Kerala Park, uh, occupancy tax appropriation in the amount of $962,000. $862 um, for a total operating uh, budget for a historic Corolla Park of $1,086,000. Mr. Cree, I want to take pause here for just a second. Not, not anything that's up there, but what's not up there. Um, I don't think Tamron's had any luck on the fireworks, finding someone to do that. Uh, actually, my understanding is that we do have a fireworks show that, that is on. Um, cool. She didn't tell me that. Yes. The, 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 right. co the company that we contract with, Dominion, um, they, the, they lost an employee who was certified in North Carolina uh, to stage fireworks shows. They sent another employee uh, to become certified. Uh, my understanding is that he has completed that process. Uh, as to his assistance, there was some issue related to uh, the requirement that our our local county fire officials sign off on their credentials after they had taken a uh, on, <laughs> online course, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the last conversation I've had with our folks is we're all good and we're moving forward with the fireworks. Oh, good. Show all right. I had told when our previous county manager was here, if that, fall, if that fell through, there's a guy in Moyoc that has, like, every certification that can... I think, I think they tried to contact him. Yeah, they, I believe they reached <laughs> yeah, out so to him. Was, so he was so that, yeah, he was already busy. Yeah. That, that show was on. Oh, Great. Well, good, good, good. Me, well, that was gonna that was gonna be another fallback that, that was, was being worked on with light show. Was a laser yeah. show. Yes. That's gonna be on July fourth, probably Monday. I think it's a Monday this well, year. July third is a Sunday. It'll be on a weekend. Yeah. Weekend or, or no? It might no, be on we, Monday. We'll do, do, Mon we do it on fourth Monday. Right. Yeah. Monday, July fourth. Um, so the other yeah, other uh, tourism related expenditures that are proposed for funding in this uh, fiscal year twenty three budget. Are, are there before you? Um, I want to pour that, point out also um, the emergency medical service uh, fire and sheriff's office um, funding. Uh, there's also some disagreement um, uh, about the utilization of tourism-related expenditures uh, for those services. Um, <clears throat> again, I note that the le enabling legislation provides for uh, those items that, in the judgment of the Curry Tuck County Board of Commissioners are intended to increase the use of lodging, convention, recreational, and other facilities within, within the county. But it's also uh, important to recognize that these funds pay for some, but not all, year-round cost uh, for fire, EMS, and sheriff, um, sheriff uh, officers, uh, including the, the, the the, the county, bottom line, cannot just pay someone to come work part of a year. And so it is understood and expected that we would fully fund these positions that are necessary uh, for the enhanced tourist season in Kerala uh, to, to cover them with full-time employees and to bring them into Kerala when necessary uh, to provide services for those tourists that are coming to visit us. So again, as with the uh, county's budget, general budget we just presented, uh, we would ask that the Board of Commission, uh, that the Tourism Development Authority hold a public hearing uh, on this budget on June 6th. Um, the opportunity, if need be, for a work session as well, um, and then for the uh, adoption at the second meeting in June. Okay, so the only action we have to take in, in uh on this board is the uh, budget amendments is that correct yes yes okay so uh, so that's the only action that the board needs to take right now is not not on the budget but on the actual budget amendments presented so um any questions on the budget amendments or so moved. sorry i just said so moved okay second motion is second uh all in favor uh, aye. aye opposed okay motion carries okay now i'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn from our special tda meeting so moved second Motion a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All opposed? Motion carries. Now I'll um, <clears throat> uh, reconvene our meeting or uh, into the special meeting for Ocean Sands Water and Sewers District Board. Convene into this meeting. And with that, we have Ike uh, presenting this as well.
Okay, you're now sitting as the governing <coughs> board for the Ocean Sands Water and Sewer District. Um, the Ocean Sands Water and Sewer District is a county water and sewer district created under Article 6, Chapter 168 of the General Statutes. <coughs> Uh, the creation of this district came out of a settlement agreement with Coastal Corporation in 1987 uh, under which the county agreed that it would, would create a water and sewer district uh, in the Ocean Sands subdivision uh, and provide for water and sewer service to that subdivision. As a water and sewer district, the district is much like a county. It is a, it is a body corporate and politic. Um, and the Board of Commissioners, as provided by statute, serves as a governing board for a water and sewer district. The proposed uh, budget uh, is before you um, with uh, operating expenses and revenues uh, to total uh, $1,207,627 for the coming fiscal year. Capital projects that are uh, proposed in the fiscal year 23 budget include for water, upgrade of aging infrastructure and meter replacement within the water and sewer district. And again, the water and sewer district is the Ocean Sands subdivision except currently uh, sections G and T. Um, for sewer, um, we propose uh, funding amph amphidrome pump spare equipment for emergency uh, tank coating to reduce algae, separation walls for dosing tank, a mobile pumping station, control panels, uh, bar screen upgrades, and a truck for the, uh, for the district. Uh, as with the other uh, enterprise funds in the county's general budget, uh, the board agreed to an increase in the annual rate uh, of, of uh, uh, fees uh, so for service, so we were proposing uh, the the, uh, the meeting of that 3.5% uh, annual rate increase over the current year, and that will continue on for a period totally of 10 years. And then the ongoing meter replacement will continue as well during the upcoming fiscal year. And then much like the other two budgets presented to you, we would ask that you hold a public hearing on this budget at your meeting on June 6th opportunity for any work sessions if you so desire uh, with uh, the adoption of the district's budget at your second meeting in June. Um, a copy of this budget will also be posted on the county's website uh, and workbooks or information provided to the board uh, tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, we don't need to take any action on the budget, but we do have to take action on the budget amendments for Ocean Sands Water District. Maybe so. approve. Well, approval. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. At this time, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn from the special meeting of the OSWSD board. Second. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, everyone. That concludes our business tonight. All right.